Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the feeding of the 4,000. You will see the inner calculations of the sinner's heart leave you falling short, but that the grace of God found in Christ Jesus makes all things add up to your eternal good. Again, from the close of our miracle, so they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand. So far the text, let us pray. Lord Jesus, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. For most students, grade school through college, the most dreaded academic subject has to be mathematics. Problem set after problem set, so many rules and formulas to memorize and follow, at some point every student laments out loud, what am I going to use any of this? in life. Unfortunately, the casualty of your ire becomes the math teacher, the one who assigns all these problems in the first place, who makes you laboriously write out each and every step, show your work, and adamantly claims there's only one right answer, hers, making you redo it so that's the one you come up with. No wonder so many don't like math, with all that fear and anxiety of getting the wrong answer, offering a guess at best, the sinking gut feeling of when your math just does not add up. Now, who knows, all grown up in your profession, maybe, maybe she was wrong and you don't use all that math, but avoid the class all you want, you still have to face that feeling. When your checkbook sits before you so unbalanced, you question whether God's promise to provide daily bread might have to be every other day. When your fields don't measure up anywhere near the statistical average of a harvestable crop, where the limit to the hours in a day forces you to focus on a least common denominator and drop the remainder, when you hit the maximum of how many times you can be taken advantage of before there's no more to be carried over the many situations of life where you find yourself left with only wrong answers. All of which corners you into making eyeball estimates, guesses at best of what your God expects, leaning by default toward equations which fall ever so slightly to your benefit. So when will you use any of this? The harsh truth is that you use such arithmetic on a daily basis, although far more a subjective approach to math than your teacher would ever have allowed not in any way that would have passed her test, nor your God's. In our Gospel lesson today, the disciples are faced with a math problem. At first glance, it's a hard one. But upon closer investigation, it's one which reveals the sinner's true frustration with life's math. 
4,000 men plus women and children, seven loaves, just a few fish. No, it would appear that this math does not add up. If it weren't for the fact that this is the second time the disciples have encountered the problem, they've already previously watched Jesus feed thousands on, a, on another occasion. Why is it so hard this time? The first time, it was less than 24 hours in, when though the disciples had no idea what Jesus' answer would be, they begged him to do something, anything, lest the people faint on their way. But in this morning's lesson, it's been a whole three days before Jesus finally has to approach them. Don't you think we should do something here? To which they respond with a peculiar anxiety. They had already seen him feed a sum greater than this. And in their hands, they have more bread than Jesus had used on that first occasion. Yet they selectively choose to appeal to their better math sense. From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? The difference is this. When previously they had so eagerly appealed him to do something, those 5,000 hungry bellies were fellow Jews, family and friends. These 4,000 on the plain of the Decapolis, these are heathen, Greek pagans, people who shouldn't be living there, people they shouldn't have to deal with in the first place. The disciples' mental block to this math problem? How convenient it is for the math not to add up when it's something you don't particularly want to do. The same mental block behind every calculated decision we make, when convenient for me, behind each situation you declare just too hard to think through without barely taking one good look. Whenever you don't want to be wrong, not even the chance of it, which is why when the math does not add up, it's the teacher who never taught you this, the problem that's done. Why wouldn't math be a whole lot more fun if by definition your answer was always the right one? But our creator's grading system is far tougher than the meanest teacher you've had. His rules, his formula, reveal how your very best calculations all fall short of his glory. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. You see, not only do you not like math, the way we go about it, neither does he. Which is why he had to send his son to make the real subject at hand, your eternal life, as plain and clear as possible. Jesus was the only perfect teacher, both fully human and fully divine. He was the incarnate fulfillment of divine prophecy, and they shall be all taught of God. A Savior whose teaching reveals our math so in opposition to the formula, love thy neighbor as thyself, 
to be the sinner's skill at massaging the numbers to our selfish favor without even trying to. But the good news of the miracle we consider today, uh, the miraculous feeding of thousands, is that when Jesus' math does not add up, it always works to your eternal favor. Using the little his disciples had, hesitant as they were, to show them once more how he had the power to break the limits we placed on God, his creation, and each other by feeding the thousands with leftovers in surplus of the first time he did. A teacher like no other, so unlike your least favorite, the schoolmaster who made you laboriously write out each and every step, make you redo it till it was right, show your work, this teacher shows you your sin your inability to work it out on your own, that you might then behold him step in and solve the equation himself by breaking our problem of sin down into the simplest of terms, as easy as one plus one. As made clear by the Apostle, wherefore as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Just like in school, when the casualty of your dislike for math becomes the teacher, our God becomes the one so easily blamed for life's more difficult challenges? Who assigns all these problems in the first place? According to scriptural arithmetic, though, not one of them comes from him. Well, they come from us on account of one man's fall, our first father, Adam. And if you need the proof, just look inside yourself, and you'll find the same sin as his. But if you can accept that fact as a given, that from one man all have sinned, the gospel balances out that repentance of yours by removing from the equation the dreaded subject of what should come of you after death. As the Apostle continues, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now this is a peculiar premise indeed. One greater than one? A divine puzzle given its explanation by Jesus' cross, an empty tomb, where two planks of wood plus two days in the grave add up to forgiveness for each and every one of your sins. Multiplied beyond measure wherever and whenever this gospel is proclaimed. The good news that Jesus, the one sent from above to teach us of God's love, endured the very worst his students could do when those previously fed by his hands sentenced him to death. Yet those hands, so pierced and restrained, could not keep from feeding thousands, millions with eternal food as those hands shed his holy, precious blood. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Meaning, 
all it took for the axiom that every man must fade into the dust. All it took for that grim fact to be disproven was for one to rise again, thereby breaking the rule of sin, liberating you from death and hell, and granting unto you in its place eternal life. Thanks be to God that not one bit of this math adds up, that Jesus, who fed the thousands, gives daily bread indeed without our asking, even, even to all the wicked, that everything with which your life abounds, food, drink, house, home, pious spouse, pious children, faithful friends, that all these things might build confidence to ask for what you truly do not deserve, the eternal treasures of forgiveness, life, and salvation. That every day you receive your daily bread, despite each negative balance you've been forced to stare at. That every year a marriage remains intact, every family gathering gladly attended, despite the tally of transgressions against each other, which accrue with each passing year, that every decision the Lord places into your hands for you to figure out when your great book reveals one failed test after another, the miracle that despite how you have departed from his ways for a path you thought wiser, you've somehow ended up right back at the Savior's feet to hear, learn, and cling to his word of life. All these instances and more meant to impress upon your heart that when the math simply does not add up, what remains is the grace of God. And with that, the blessed realization that the grace of God is all you ever had. All showered upon you in abundance that your life might be a reflection of the uneven measure of grace shown you. As Luther explains, so will we surely also heartily forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against Tipping the balance in the calculated manner of love in favor toward others as the gospel opens your eyes to God's bottomless supply. How in Christ Jesus, even what you lack all now adds up to your eternal So maybe higher algebra, calculus, Euclidean geometry, maybe you don't use any of that. But when it comes to the Word of God, these principles speak to everything you encounter, solve every problem you cannot. The question then is no longer a rhetorical one. When am I going to use any of this in life? The grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pay attention. This you're going to need every single day. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.